You're listening to a Pop House Network podcast for developers by developers. Welcome to Pop House episode 100. <laughs> hey everyone, uh, this is the 100th episode of our podcast, and is 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 kind of fun because we are going to cover soup to nuts. You always hear about it. You might be working on it, but it's kind of fuzzy. We're going to be talking about the cloud, and um, and 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 like like uh, like we were talking earlier, like Pop was saying, like it only took us how many episodes to get to the cloud? yeah, what like a hundred. But <laughs> you know what? We're here, you know, and, and and we're arriving just at the same time. A lot of other developers are arriving and getting started in the cloud, or maybe you've been doing it for a little while. Um, but we're here to share our experiences and, and like, we were looking at our agenda for today and it's like, man, like we're not going to cover all in one episode. So, you know, what we're going to start you off with is a, is a kind of an overview today. And then we're going to get a second episode where we're going to go in depth, where we're going to have, you know, what yeah. you usually expect of us from pub houses, code samples and, and demos and, and just really talk through, you know, what you can do on these platforms um, with your Java knowledge and, and even kind of beyond that, some of the tools that, that go beyond Java and, and let, help you build out cloud environments uh, for your clients or for your employer or for yourself. Yeah, yeah, no. So for those who are tuning in for the first time, uh, you know, welcome aboard. Um, uh, my name is Freddie Gime. I'm one of the principal engineers at Expedia, um, author, speaker, um, Java champion, and uh, I'm here with my usual uh, co-host, Bob. Hey, everybody. My name is Bob Pollan. I'm an independent consultant from Chicago. I am the CJUG board chair, Apache Software Foundation member, um, also a, a speaker, and um, yeah, excited to be here with you all today talking about the cloud. Right, right. So before we dive in, I wanted to uh, thank the sponsor of our episode. Today's show is sponsored by Datadog, a monitoring and analytics platform that integrates with over 450 technologies, including AWS services, Docker, and Kubernetes. Datadog's platform brings together metrics, traces, and logs in one place, so you can get full visibility into your environment and improve your application performance. With machine learning-based alerts, customizable dashboards, and distributed tracing, Datadog makes it easy to unify disparate data sources so you can troubleshoot faster. Start your free Datadog trial today. Listeners of this podcast will receive a free t-shirt once you install the agent and create one dashboard. Visit javapophouse.com slash Datadog to get started. Again, that URL is javapophouse.com slash Datadog. And we thank them to, um, for being the sponsor of this episode and for keeping the mics on and the beers rolling and uh, <laughs> the video recording. So uh, so thanks, Dave Dog, for sponsoring this episode. All right. So so let's dive into it. Um, you know, and I guess it, the the first part is is understanding, like, you know, like we I guess we started with the cloud. When was it? Five, ten, ten years? Was it 10 years ago? I think it's actually been longer than that. I mean, so, you know, AWS has been around for 10 plus years. I, I'd actually have to Google, um, you know, when it started. Let's see. So AWS has launched 2006. So this is almost... 15 years, oh, 15 years. <laughs> that we've had, <laughs> that we've had the cloud on AWS. Um, and, you know, even before then, you know, there was cloud, there other, you know, there was other cloud type things. Um, but, you know, as, as we understand today, I guess what you would call the modern cloud, um, I think it's fair to say, you know, it, that started with what AWS yeah. started stubbing out in 2006. Right. Um, where you know it's it's now a a, a kind of a, a one stop shop for for everything that you want to do um, with your development environment. Like you know, basically the pitch now is you know you can host your entire infrastructure in the cloud. You know you can you it used to be you you go in to a project you'd have to tell somebody how many servers you needed. They would then place an order for those servers. 
the order would be placed. Eventually the equipment gets shipped. Then there's the OS installation process. Then there's hardening. And then at some point they turn it over to the development team with the level of access way too low to do anything. And then you need to install, you know, all your software. Well, the, the days of that have sort of changed, right? So we're, we've yeah. gone back, we've actually gone back in time in, in some sense to a, a, an environment where a lot of that is just sort of managed for you, which, you know, for those of us that have, have been working long enough to remember, you know, IBM DB2 mainframe environments where it's just like, it's there and it works. Yeah, that's, that's so sort nice. of the first version of the cloud, you know, so it's, you're, you're kind of dependent on a, a vendor that's providing you with a, an, a complete infrastructure environment that you can tap into, provision things, set things up, and then, you know, you're not running it. They yeah. are. And to add some color to that, like, I still remember back in the day when you needed to plan for, a, for laying out a network, and it was like always a rule of thumb is like, Whatever you ask for, double it, and then <laughs> double it again. Because by the time everything is laid down, everything, all the requirements come in, is going to be like you were too short on the number of servers, you were too short on the number of networking, you know, like provision IP addresses that you needed to get. Like it's, it's always this, and it's the problem is like because it is like capital investments, it's very hard to move that fast. Like every time you had to like buy a server. It will take you weeks before it, it it actually make a difference in like what you were building, right? So so it, in in that sense, you know, like we we abhor decentralization. Like we we sort of like you know we like it when somebody is managing things for us uh, because that is one less headache that that we have to suffer through. And and I think that that um, the interesting story was Amazon was trying to figure out how they automate these things, how they how they make it easier for their for their developers to create new things. And suddenly, you know, they start creating all this infrastructure and all these management things. Um, and they got some leftover capacity. That's how, sort of like the story goes that's how this started. Right. E-commerce has always been, you know, for, for a long time, actually, that's even changing now, has been focused around you know, what they call Black Friday, right? Where, where everybody finally moves from the red into the black was, was how, it, how it was said, you know, which is usually right around Thanksgiving. It's the Friday after Thanksgiving was traditionally what it was. And, and from a, a, a uh, uh, hardware standpoint, it was always a challenge running e-commerce and being like, you have to buy your hardware, scale your hardware to that one day of the year where you're going to get that wave of traffic and you don't want to be going, taking downtime then because you're, you're, you could be depending on the scale of your business, losing millions of dollars every minute that you're down, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's an insane amount of traffic. It's an insane amount of money to be made. So Amazon had the, the same problem. They had to scale to that. And it's like, well, we have all this equipment sitting around for the rest of the year. What do we do with it? Make a business. <laughs> Make a business out of it. So, um, yeah, that, that's how the story goes, as I understand it, too. Um, they uh, figured out how to use that excess capacity and, and became very, very good at um, creating it so it could be self-service. You know, I think yes. that was that's that's been the, the biggest thing is, is, you know, mainframes, as much as, you know, there is a good analogy there, it's certainly not as e easy to use as what we what we work with today. Um, in our mm -hmm. cloud providers. And I think that like, even if today, like you're using, I, w one of the things is that even if today you're using the cloud, understanding the underpinnings, understanding exactly how things flow mm -hmm. uh, will make you such a much productive developer. Because one, one, one of the challenges that I always see, you know, with, even when I was getting exposed to this is that it almost feels like, like, uh, like you're drowning on choice, right? Like uh, if you go, if you ever open an AWS console or if you open a, whatever Google console looks like or Azure, uh, Azure you'll see like there's a hundred kinds of services all screaming for your attention. And, and it's very hard to navigate, like understanding logically what why would I want this? Why would I want that? And, and that's why, like, 
when we were talking with Bob today, like, oh, maybe we should split it in two and do like the first part is just conceptually get you there. You know, like, like you know, like what, what do you have all these parts of the infrastructure and, and how does it make sense on the cloud versus versus just, ha just having a server in your closet at the office that you work. This was, you know, 15, 20 years ago, we just have like four servers in there and, and trying to hook it up together. How does that translate into running things in the cloud? Yeah, and, and we're gonna kind of break this episode into a couple different parts um, because there's a there's, even though there's so many different things in the cloud, fundamentally there's ways to categorize these things and, and we're gonna try to do that for you. So, I mean, we're gonna start with what we will call, I guess, the core of it, which is determining, you know, users, you know, how you're actually going to authenticate and access your cloud environment, policies, just the security around, you know, who can do what in your cloud environments. And then we're going to go into the different, the, the next thing of interest is, well, how do I get things done? So there's the different execution environments. So there's different ways to run your Java code in these clouds. Um, and, you know, I, I come from not just an AWS experience. I've also used Azure in anger before. So I'll, I'll be chiming in with the Azure equivalent. I unfortunately haven't done any GCP. So, you know, no, no, no love lost to Google, but um, I have to use your cloud before I can talk about it. Um, so it, it's going to be mostly on AWS and, and Microsoft's cloud Azure. Um, and then from there, we'll also talk about services that support your Java code. So, you know, hey, what do I need to use for storing files? What do I need to use for messaging? What are the, some of the things, you know, I need to do, know about for networking? Um, so we're going to talk through just conceptually some of those high level things. Yep, yep, yep. So like like you said, let's let's dive into it. Like like the very first part, right? Like um is is essentially this concept of of identity, right? Yep. Like if you happen to be, you know, again 15 years ago, 20 years ago, um, or I guess like, yeah, um, you used to be like uh, oh, you have an LDAP server somewhere where there was like an active directory. Whereas you sometimes try to log in some extra information, and that's how Log4j <laughs> zero day happened. But uh, usually you have like, a, like an authority inside your network that says, oh, this is Freddy. He has uh, group access to all these folders, right? And, and that is where we start now in the cloud environment. If you think about the cloud environment, um, you know, in AWS or, or, or Azure or, or Google Cloud, the very first thing is, is they said like, let's set up, how do you want to do the identity management for, for your enterprise, right? And, and, um, and I think that like in, in, in AWS terms, it's like they want to call the IM, which is identity and access management, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. And um, the idea is that this is, not necessarily your logging. If you remember how LDAP does things, it's like first it recognizes that you are somebody that you know have you know that has an LDAP entry. Like you identify your username and password, identifies you to LDAP. But that is almost like a gateway to what they call you know your group permissions. Meaning like uh, my role is a software developer role, and I have access to a database. I have access to the development servers. And all these things are not necessarily that, oh, Freddie is a new employee, I'm gonna give him access to these things. It will be, Freddie's a new employee, uh, he's part of the software developer group, and suddenly I have access to everything. Nobody has to start managing like all the individual permissions that I need to have, you know? So that 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 sort of concept, you know, like if somebody else comes in, let's say Mary comes in and the, then Mary is a, a, you know, technical product manager, she has access to like all the product manager folders and product manager like software, whereas I don't have access to those. And, and the way they, the easiest way to manage these is by the concept of groups, right? And, and that is the first concept that you're gonna run into AWS where yes, if you, if you create your own account for the very first time, you have sort of like the root access to everything on that account. And that's what they call it, right? A root account. So you have your administrator access, but they recommend if you're going to be doing this any more than just a personal account, it's a good idea to create other accounts with reduced permissions where you're not logging in, where if somebody 
gets that password is going to run up your AWS bill, right? So Somebody I mean, that's will be Bitcoin mining uh, will be Bitcoin mining on your account, <laughs> and they're not going to have any disregard for how much money they're spending. Oh, um, so that is that is a good point too. So let's um, before we we dive in, I think that it is important to understand um, that concept of cost um, because. The AWS, and I don't know if, if they were the first, but they're definitely one of the the um, you know one of the most known that they will essentially charge you for almost just to this to the cent or the micro cent really yeah. of how much co- what they call compute power are you using, right? So so be this like um, oh I need to store some data, they will charge you by the you know. Megabyte, megabyte, right? If, gig. Oh, yeah. gig. Yeah, well, they run a lot that. of it's in gigs, you know. Yeah. Um, how many, like, let's say, do you have a DNS entry? How many DS, DNS entries do you have? Uh, you want static IP addresses for whatever reason. They'll charge you a per month on that static IP address. And, mm-hmm. and the charges are not big. There'll be like, you know, 10 cents here, 20 cents there per hour, something like that. But then, once you start looking at an infrastructure, then then the thing, you know, could be a big bill, right? And, and you can hear the horror stories where where <laughs> AWS before is like, oh, I didn't realize I was just running a, I was submitting a Spark job that ran <laughs> like for three days, and somehow it it spewed out ten thousand servers, and it, it finished it finished in three days. You know, I analyzed the work, but then my bill is you know a hundred thousand dollars, and and that is. That is another reason why, um, you know, splitting your 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 root essentially hardening your root access from the beginning is always a good idea, especially in these environments where there is somebody who does does really not does not respect or or, or is an adversary, um, you know, could really create damage by doing all these billing things or all this uh, using charging these resources that you really didn't want them to do. So, yeah, um, I mean, they've fundamentally turned this into an accounting problem. Whereas, you know, before it was an asset, it's fixed cost, you spend X amount of money and that's expected to last so long and eventually it gets deprecated. No, this is an accounting problem where, okay, I want to use this much. Um, and, you know, sometimes that's going to come out to be cheaper, especially in the small, like when I'm just getting started on a project, it's nice to be able to not have to buy a bunch of servers to just try something out. Yeah. Um, but at scale, it's fair to say that cloud may not actually be a cost savings because you are being billed per request where if you own it, it doesn't matter how many requests necessarily come in as long as I'm not over my bandwidth that I'm paying my internet provider. Yeah, yeah, and I'm paying my electric bill and things like that. It's a different model. Their model again is built on usage, whereas previous models were built on assets and capital investment. So right, right. important to understand that um, as you're building out your cloud environment. Yeah, and and remember, like the advantage that you have is that you have a very elastic. Uh, infrastructure, meaning like uh, like Bob says, like you know the bane of the existence of the e-commerce sites when Black Friday rolls around and there's just not enough power to do everything. AWS will allow you to just all right. I need to have twice what I used to have before. Three clicks of a button, and then suddenly your infrastructure just go out. Double. Massively. Yeah, no, absolutely. Right. So so that is the that's. A big part of the reason that you're paying for that, right? Like yeah. if you if you really want that elasticity, and the advantage is that after you're done, you said, okay, we're done with Black Friday. Let's turn it off. Let's yeah. turn it off, and I don't have to pay a penny more for the extra infrastructure that I was using that day. Yeah. And let's get back to you know what we were talking about as far as is access. So I mean, you know, Freddie talked about we have this concept of users. We have roles of users that are assigned different permissions. And you know those permissions can be as fine grained as I can read from a database. Which you know, if you're using an unstructured database in a, in in AWS, that's DynamoDB. You know, so it's like I can give somebody a permission that says I get to read from this table and this resource in DynamoDB, and that's all that user can do. And that happens at a policy level. So 
you know, and, and this is this is also true of Azure is, is you have these fine grained policies that relate to certain actions that you can take on the cloud resources. And usually it breaks down versus, you know, read versus write permissions, delete permissions. You know, can you create these resources? Can you delete the resources? Can you read them? Can you write them? Can you list out all the instances of it? And depending on your use case, you may want to set different policies. Um, you know, in a multi-tenant environment where I have more than one customer running code, you know, that I'm running code for, I may not want them to be able to list out every single, you know, VM that's running in my infrastructure. So I may not give them a list permission, but I may give them read permission with a certain naming convention. Um, you know, and I think that's something we might get into a little bit more when we get into our code examples. But uh, another thing that can't be understated for cloud environments is yeah, naming things is still a CS problem and it is especially <laughs> true in the cloud if you're going to organize it in a way that is sane. Um, so coming up, a little bit of an aside, you know, we could probably take another aside on cloud naming standards, but let's get into that more um, when we start looking at code because then we can actually talk about pragmatically, you know, hey, I'm gonna name it this and, and how does that flow through to the policies and everything like that. Um, right. But, User roles. Um, so users have potentially many roles. Roles are composed of potentially many policies. And those policies can be groupings of different permissions that allow specific access to cloud resources, to resources with certain names that where the, the names match. Um, <clears throat> and each of those can be rolled all the way up um, you know, to what level of access that an individual has in my ecosystem. Now, um, another thing to kind of think about is, is programmatic access. So, I mean, like, um, in AWS, you know, I can log in as myself and do things on behalf of myself, but sometimes I may want to do things <clears throat> within a program. So AWS also has different credentialing where I can do, uh, a, a secret and a key in order to associate with a specific user that has certain roles and certain policies associated with those roles. Mm -hmm. um, Azure has an equivalent in, a, in what they call a service principle, where again, I will generate a user with specific permissions and policies. And mm -hmm. in return for that, I will get a key and a secret associated with that service principle. And that allows that service principle to create resources and take action in Azure on my behalf, usually you know, in a programmatic setting. Um, right, right. And if, if you remember, this is going back to the days where, where there was the famous or infamous service accounts, right? Mm -hmm. where, where you created and essentially is not a I log in with this account the interactively it's more like there is a service running that needs to do certain things, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe you like, you know, as part of your role uh, for yourself or as a developer, I have like read only access to a data store. But when I am programming, you know, like the, you know, let's say a service that needs to update an inventory or do that, my service does have the read write on that particular, um, you know, uh, database because it needs to, right? So, so that is that is a very um, you know, and, and it's, it is the what is like the principle of 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 everything oh, you know, close by default, you know, where you know you and if you're really just starting, this is the best advice is that make it secure from the get go, just give permissions only to the things that need it, right? Like um, even all the way to you know, once once you get down into the weeds, there is also like for example permissions of like. Ooh, firewall permissions. Can this mm -hmm. web server reach the internet? Like, you yep. know, the regular internet, like, can it go to google.com? And then it's like, you can actually set policies or, or you know, saying, nope, everything is, is blacklisted. And then, you know, little by little, you start adding where, what do you need to whitelist on, on that? So, so yes, uh, it's, um, you know, as you start creating this and, and, and probably I'll say like, 60% of cloud issues is usually permissions. Permission, like, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, yep. 
so so there and there are some tricks right like like if you know this already and you know that this is based on roles and you know you can like the very first thing if something is not connecting or something says denied or it says like 404 or 503 um you know it's it usually means that look the role that you're using is not you know it does not have that permission so the very first thing that you that you know as you're thinking about it is like trying to really uh, say like oh what is the role that I'm running this under, right? And the I could be you yourself, like you're interactively doing something, or it could be the I of your server, you know, if you're running a piece of code on the cloud. Right, and that's an important distinction. So, I mean, you know, there's, there's roles can be assigned to what are called execution roles. So you may have a process running, um, maybe it's a function, and we'll get into execution environments next. Yep, yep. Um, but when that process is running, that process has authority to do things. So, I mean, when you think about how you secure environments um, with APIs, with third parties, you think, okay, well, you know, I'm, I usually have a secret and I'll have a key. And that turns into a lot of different passwords to store and a lot of different authentication uh, pieces that I have to now deal with. Well, this is where roles is really your friend because rather than, hey, I need another password in order to connect to the database, you know, in AWS, the RDB, you know, the relational database service, I could actually create a policy, an execution policy that has access to read from a certain resource. So if I need to save things to that database, I'm not thinking necessarily in terms of, of the passwords and, and, and uh, you know, the, um, Credentials, uh, credentials to log in, I set the policy on the execution service. And because it's running in the same cloud, that policy is known to the database and can authenticate me autom automatically, essentially, yeah. um, which also works with maybe your Docker registry, where I'm expecting to run a container in a certain environment. It happens with source code. I mean, so anything that you can imagine that you might connect to where it's like, oh boy, I need another username and password or I have to store a secret somewhere. No, the first tool to usually reach for in that case is your, your execution policy and see if, is there a way I can assign a policy here where this runtime can do the thing that it needs to do and then I don't have to worry about those credentials. Right, right, right. like, yeah, so, so it, is, it is almost like, you know, look back at the code that you're running for the cloud. If you ever needed to add uh, like a username, a password, and hopefully you're not adding it on your configuration files. We have three episodes ago, we talked about- We did, we talked about secret managers. So right. you should but, know how to do that part, but there's yeah. a better way. <laughs> yeah. But but it should be a hint. Like if this is if this is a service that that is within AWS or within the cloud, like you say like, oh, I'm creating, I'm just running a password for my, DNS or my S3 bucket, right? Like that is a strong signal that, oh, wait a minute, maybe there is something that AWS can just add to that particular execution role and, and I don't have to deal with it. And my application, every time it runs, it knows already that it has access. I don't have to like identify myself with a new username or password or stuff like that. So, you know, that's, it's, keep that in mind. But, but going, going down, um, like we said, right? Like we're getting close to like, you know, we're talking about execution uh, roles and all that. And that is because like, at the end of the day, as software engineers, we want to run code. That is, that's, that's what we're paid for. And, you know, we're paid to create code that has to run somewhere. And I think that is, you know, after figuring out your login and password and that there is permissions and there's roles, the big part that, that we should tackle now is like, how do I run things, right? Because that's the end of the day, that's what we need to like do. Right. And there's a hundred different ways, no, there's not a hundred, but there are many there's different ways to do it. <laughs> yeah, there's many different ways to do it. And to be perfectly frank, like each one has its place. There's no one of these that you must do that we're gonna say, hey, for every situation. Just do this. Just do this. No. Depending on what you're doing, one of these is probably going to fit your situation. So, I mean, let's let's talk about the very first one, which is the most managed of the solutions, uh, which is also probably the most limited. But it's the one where it's like literally like you are 
started in a snap because there is no infrastructure for you to set up. There's no anything. And that's functions. So in AWS, that's Lambda. And in Azure, that's they have something called app service functions that serves a, a very similar purpose. Right. And let's uh, before before we we dive into because like the like and I don't know if it was just AWS, but Lambda's Lambda's had like um like a big cognition of of for example um streams, right? Like that actually Lambda so so to not make it confusing, there is <laughs> Lambda's within the Java. Java, e yeah. And we've talked about those. Yes, yes, which is essentially a little bit like anonymous inner classes, but essentially is just a piece of code that you know doesn't have a. It's almost like it doesn't have a, a surrounding class. It's just like there's a function. Here's the function for you to to do things, right? And we call that lambda in in code. Uh, somebody got cute and say, how do we call like a program that runs in a big you know infrastructure thing? Oh, because it's just a little program. We're gonna call that a lambda. And uh, and that sort of have stuck, right? Like uh, like like you know they are two different things. Right now, when we're talking infrastructure, lambda is very specific to a piece of code that you want to run. Um, you know, and and you just really that is really what it is. It's like I want to run this. I don't care how it runs. I don't. I just want you to execute on this. And um, and uh, like 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 uh, Bob said, you know, like. You are very, um, you don't, the, the beauty of it is you don't have to specify all these hundred things that you need to specify for running other type of code. It's almost like, uh, look, I will just, I just need you to execute this piece of code. And once it's done, it's done. And, yeah. and to, to be, to, to be in interesting is that, you know, like what, one of the, the, the hiccups I have when I was learning lambdas is like, what is, how is a lambda work for like running a shopping like like how can I make something that is useful, and and the the thing that sometimes people forget to tell the story is that lambdas can be triggered by events that are happening outside of that lambda, right? right? So so let's so let's let's go over a little bit. The, the, the very first part is lambda is really just like 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 we said, it's a page of code. Um, you know, in, in AWS, there is essentially, um, you can create, you can create a jar, um, you can create essentially package a jar that has a specific entry points for Lambda events, um, that will execute that, or, you know, you can do it on Python. Like some people are more comfortable doing like Lambda on Python and there's a couple other languages that you can do it on. But the idea is that, that, um, AWS on a particular event or, you know, and the event could be a timer. It could be something right. that you decide, hey, I want to run every 10 minutes or every three hours. Um, it will spin up a, you know, an ephemeral, meaning like it, it, it's not, it's just something that it gets created, you know, a, a ephemeral like VM, um, you know, essentially standard a server, then put drops jar in, starts a Java platform, and then says like, okay, call this method because it's with this parameters because this is the event that we're responding to. And all of this is hand wavy because again, you're not exposed to any of that. So I mean, you know, the best the best way to to think of of Lambda, and again, I would actually argue that that Azure actually has a more accurate name. But it's a function, right? So function we understand as programmers, right? A function is a method that has a name that takes parameters and may have a return value from it. So, I mean, when you think of what is a Lambda function, think of it as a method, a function in your code that has parameters and has a return value optionally. So, yeah. and, and whatever happens in between is what you wrote. Um, so, you know, when Freddie's talking about triggers, those are the things that feed in the parameters to your method. They can come from multiple sources, but as long as within your method, you have a means of taking those parameters and putting them to work for you, it doesn't matter if it's coming from a message bus or an HTTP request or, or from a file, from an yeah. email. There's so many different things that you can use to trigger these things is really they end up being the glue to your cloud infrastructure. It's like, ah, this thing almost does what I want, but I need to make it do 
this in a custom way. Write a function, have it do the thing, have it that feed into your function, your function does the custom thing, you're on your merry way. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's really, these are integration and glue for your cloud environment um, yeah, is, like, a, is a good like, way to think about it. Like an example for it, just to make it more concrete, right? Like, let's say that, that you have a provider and this happens, you know, <laughs> this happens a lot in like the industry that I'm in that will ship you an email with a file, right? Let's see, or they drop it on an FTP folder somewhere, right? And you want something that happens when that file gets deposited there. You want to open it up, read it, parse it. And let's say that, that it, con it contains flight schedules for like, you know, like your next flight. And then you take that, uh, that sort of like drop in, you open it up, you process it, and then you insert all that information into a database. Right, and then now that you updated the schedules because of this new updated file that was sent to you, you know the lambda will do all that. Like lambdas, sometimes they can be they can be complex. It is recommended that you don't keep it that complex, but you're supposed to like do things like this, where it's like pick something, write into a data store, create new events. You can essentially cascade this these events to other lambdas that need to do other things. Let's say that maybe there is a Lambda that has to recompute a cache or recompute some kind of like, like uh, things now that the database is updated. It's like, oh, their database was updated. Now you need to do these other things, right? Um, so, so the idea is that, that you know, you land there, and that's what like Bob says, like optionally returns a, uh, returns a value because sometimes you don't need to return a value. The Lambda, the function itself is doing the work that you needed to do, which is, add to a data store, send an email back saying, thank you, verifying that the file that was uploaded was right, right? All these other things. And, 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 um, and, and again, you know, if you think about it, this is really just sitting in the middle of an ecosystem. So, so you know, an event came in, you know, you woke up, you executed, and then you can either say like, I'm done because I executed and I did all my database writing or my message pipelining, all that. Or you can say like, look, now I'm gonna raise a new event that maybe other lambdas are interested in hearing about, right? Like, mm -hmm. oh, data updated for, you know, like flights, number one, two, three, right? Uh, and of course, you know, as the lambda executes, uh, every cloud provider will, will remember how long it took to execute. <laughs> how many times it was executed. Yeah. And we'll give you the 15 cent uh, <laughs> charge, which is for one land is amazing. But if this is something that executes a lot of times within the day, then expect that, that yeah, like, you know. Well, and, and there's interesting, so it's, 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 it's even more complicated than that. So, I mean, it also, you know, in a, in a JVM setting, well, in actually any programming language setting, you also are able to throttle, you know, how much memory um, it's using. So, you know, obviously if, if your process is more memory intensive, the cost per execution goes up um, because right. that is a, it, it is computed with, okay, you ran for this long with this much memory allocated. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also ways of, of, you know, when you think about that, it's like, okay, well, if it's just starting and materializing anywhere, like, and it's not warm, you know, especially from a, you know, somebody that comes from a JVM background that knows, hey, you know, you got to kind of warm these things up before they get fast. There are certain trade-offs with your functions because it is starting from a, what's called a cold start. Yep. You will actually have to deal with the JVM starting up, the code, all the classes being loaded for each invocation yeah. and the, um, the JIT being in sort of a, you know, a, a new state where it hasn't had any cycles to run and optimize itself. Um, so these other things you can look at is, is what's called provision concurrency in a AWS environment where it will just keep certain things warm and running and just waiting for a call to come in. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, with it, with a JVM process, there are certain things that Java is not necessarily tuned for. And that's, you know, one of those things to start up. Now there's other things you can look at. We've talked about on the show about um, uh, native compilation with Grawl, um, which takes a lot of that startup time out of it. You know, that's when, you know, having a, a millisecond startup time for your process becomes super important. Actually money, yeah. Because it, it involves less memory and less time. It can actually have a significant financial impact if you're running Java processes 
at scale as functions. Yep, yep, and 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 that is that is true. Like um, one of the things that yeah, I, I remember like reading from AWS, like like you're right. Like um, a lot of the times, it's it's not we make it sound naive. Uh, like oh, I'm starting a new JVM every time there's a Lambda uh, event. But but yeah, the 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 reality is a little bit more nuanced. I think by default, I think when you wake up a lambda, um, it will stay it will stay up quote unquote up and running True. for like five yep. or ten minutes um, before saying like okay, I I I spent this time waiting for other events, nothing came. Okay, I'm gonna shut it down. And I think like AWS is kind enough not to bill you for those. Uh, like if the lambda was not doing anything, but but there is there are tricks, right? Um, yeah. But but yeah, actually, growl was um, not necessarily if that was the use case, but they were very interested in like can we create something that that is very like open up, start, do it quickly, close up, right? Yeah. So, um, no, and I mean it becomes very important because when you look at a language like Java that's really been tuned for multi-threaded environments for longer running processes. You know, functions are the exact opposite of that. Um, so, you know, if you're looking at a process where you're going to try to do really fast scale ups and things like that, Lambda does have the ability to scale. So the more load that comes in, AWS is managing how many of these things to start. But if each one of those has a cold start, there could be performance implications of using your Java process in a function. Yep. So, I mean, the, the function you know, like we said, none of these are silver bullets. The function is really nice for getting started. I can get started with just a simple jar file. I don't have to worry about a Docker container. If I want to use Docker, I can um, for Lambda, but I can start with a simple jar file and that's it. I just upload the jar file and it just runs, yeah. um, which is pretty amazing coming from a background where you had to request a server and then install the SDK and no, all of that's there waiting for you. You just tell it, hey, this is a Lambda. I want Java on it. This is the version of Java I want. And I upload a jar. And then all I need is stuff to come in and trigger it, um, which is pretty amazing. And all I'm doing is implementing, you know, if I use just the AWS SDK, I'm implementing a simple interface. And again, it is just a method with parameters. And I can send output. It's I'm writing a method in Java and I am getting something live within seconds, which is pretty amazing. Right. I think then then in 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 terms of like the next the next level, right? Like uh, you know, again, Landas does have a specificity. You mm -hmm. want something that is event driven, you want something that is small within scope. And 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 by the way, it doesn't mean that you have one lambda. Usually when if you decided to take this this kind of like 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 software design approach, you're gonna have you know, to create a system, you may have 10, 20, 50 lambdas and they all do like different parts of things. Right. Um, but it, you cannot create a system, a complete system. I mean, you can. You can, but, but it's, you may not want to. There may be use cases where, you know, a lot of those advantages you get with the Java programming languages come into play. I want to be able to serve multiple requests on a warm. I want warm. logs. I want I, logs. Well, actually, you get logs from Lambdas. Lambdas will still log. Hard, it is okay. not hard. It is not hard. I don't, I don't know. Like, maybe, maybe It's maybe. different because it's it's per instance, right? So there's, yeah. you know, we can get into the specifics of that, but I feel like that's a next episode thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. But to just kind of I, seeing where you're going, you know, if, if I want a longer running process, if I want a process that's going to stay up, but maybe I still don't want that experience of, geez, I need a, a complete service server set up, you know, that I have to patch and that I have to maintain. Um, what's the next level up? If I, if I want, maybe, maybe I'm starting with just a Docker container or something like that. And I want to run that. Um, but I don't want to deal with VMs and I don't want to deal with maintenance issues. What, what can I go to next? Yeah. I think, I think is, is, is container services, right? So yeah. Like ECS, like, uh, ECS for 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 AWS. I don't know what is. The and then app, so app service uh, app services also supports a containerized environment in the Azure uh, environment. So I mean, it has similar functionality. So we're in AWS. AWS has Docker repositories just sitting there waiting for you to use. Uh, Azure has ACR, which is the Azure uh, Container Registry. So you have an entire registry where you can push Docker containers, and those containers. 
you know, using your policies and your roles can get deployed to app services in Azure where um, I'm just, I just have a Docker container um, and it's going to run whatever's in that Docker container. But if I look at the screen that shows all my VMs and the things in the OS, you know, the things that I know I'm going to have to patch and have to maintain, there's nothing to be seen because those VMs are hosted by the cloud environment. So any sort of OS maintenance, patching, I'm not thinking about that. I maintain my Docker container and my jar that runs inside of it. Right. That's and, it. And then to, to go, to go for those who like Docker is so a magic word. Um, we did have an episode on Docker, I think, you know, like probably like 10 or 15 episodes ago, but what it is, is essentially, um, it's, it's a combination of, of, of description, right. Where you describe like, uh, a machine that you want things to run in, right? But you describe it very loosely. It's going to be a Linux machine. Mm -hmm. um, you want to install this version of Linux and you wanted it to run with this kind of like, you know, you can sort of set the startup to say like, I want this kind of Java and here is my jar, right? I like the beauty about containers is that, that it, it runs the same everywhere. So anything that knows how to do Docker, quote unquote, will guarantee that you are running essentially the same kind of like machine type, right? Like the same Linux type, the exact the same um, Java type that you specified on that Docker sort of like recipe that, that you have. It's like the Docker file, right? So so the, the thing that you don't have control is, is, for example, you cannot say I wanted it to have, you know, like 12 processors or 20 processors I wanted it to be this class of processors. I wanted it to run like uh, like on, on Windows. Like uh, there's, yeah. So there's, you're giving away some of the stuff, but you, what you get is, is that portability of like a container. It's a container, it's a container on any Docker environment. So so one of the things that, that ECS does is that like Bob says, it's essentially imagine there is a sea of servers somewhere uh, on the East Coast, uh, you know, or on the West maybe the West Coast, maybe China. I mean, that's another thing to kind of mention about these oh, cloud gosh, providers yeah. is they have data centers everywhere. So depending on where you want a server, you kind of get to pick. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and, and and you can make decisions based on like, oh my, I have my, I want my my data center to be close to Asia because I do a lot of business with Asia, right? Um, but but the idea is that. The one thing about the cloud is that at the very end of the day, it is a physical server on a rack somewhere in the world, right? But the good thing about like, for example, ECS is that you don't worry about that. You just, you just, uh, you know, a server will be picked for you that it will be partitioned right. Uh, and then suddenly your, your container is running somewhere on a server, some, in, in the middle of the world, right? The advantages, the other advantage that you have is that that because you did not have to worry about specifying all this, like I want 60 CPUs, I want it to be exactly 23 gigabytes, and I want it to exactly be this way. Um, you know, the you know, a lot of the Amazon then then starts saying, okay, you know, how many of these you need, like how many containers you need, right? Like and it's like, oh, I need 10 of them. And it figures out all that stuff. Like before you, it was always this game of like Lego where you're trying to figure out, oh, there's enough space on this particular right, server right, to right. put another thing in here. Or no, this one cannot fit in there. Maybe we should move it to another one. Like all of that is completely disappears from, from, from your field of vision, you know? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's still limitations where you're gonna dictate, well, so I, I have a Docker container, but I wanna dictate like, what is the memory that I'm going to be allocating in ECS for this Docker container? What is the, the CPU shares? So I may not say, hey, give me 20 processors, but there's virtual processors that I have to allocate for my process. Right. And in, in true cloud form, the amount you're charged is based on how heavily you provision it. So if you know the more CPUs you require, the more money, the more memory you require, that money goes up even faster. Mm -hmm. um, and there's limits to how many you can have on a single process, but that's still a step up from 
functions where in functions you you can define memory but you're not really talking about cpu shares so now i can actually put cpu share limits and i actually have more control over the scaling because like i can start at one and then i can go up to as many as whatever these limits are which is another kind of cloud thing to know even though it's like, hey, you can scale to infinity, there are usually soft and hard limits on a lot of cloud resources. So you do have to think about what the limitations. When I started using ECS, um, there was a limit of, I believe it was like 40 tasks per region that you're in. That's since been extended. And a lot of times these things change, but you had to take that into account that if I needed more than 40 processes in a specific region um, for what I was running, mm -mm. I had to think, okay, I got to put this in this region. I got to put this in that region. So you have to think about those things. But with an ECS, once I define a task for that, as long as that task is running, it starts up and that process runs as long as that process in the Docker container is active. So if you know I get it out of memory or something like that, ECS will typically realize that and just restart it for me. So it's I, I get in this situation where you know function it, it calls it once and it could throw it away it could keep it warm like what freddie was talking about but with ecs it's basically just running my docker container using the same rules um, that i would be setting you know if i was running docker on a vm where it's monitoring the process for health you know i've got logs attached to it which you know is reading and write you know from the council that the app is logging to yeah, um, that's, that's the I can attach load balancers and supporting services, which we'll talk about later. Um, but that process stays up. It stays warm. I can scale it to a certain number of instances, to a certain number. So if I am, a, and I can even create auto scaling functionality off of that. And in yeah. all of these, you know, again, it's supported in app services in Azure um, as well. Um, so I have this basically auto scale process where all I did was create a Docker container and some configuration around what I wanted that Docker container to run in. And I'm still in that situation where I don't own the VMs. I didn't have to think about how many servers to buy beforehand. And I'm paying for the running time in that case. Instead of invocations on an ECS, it's usually all about, um, you know, what, is, what am I provisioning in CPU shares and memory and how long is it running? Yep. And, and yeah, to bring, to bring um, you know, also a couple of things. Like usually, um, like ECS will also give you access to, like for example, file systems, right? Like like Docker's usually will come with with a little bit of a file file system and everything. Like by default, it's like fifteen five yep. gigs um, on AWS, and um, you know, which is you know, like it, it allows you to do certain things. That was one of the things that I remember running into Londis. It's like, oh, I need to write a file. Oh, there's no file where I can write, right? Like it's, it becomes weird uh, if you need to like do certain things because it is a method that disappears at the end of it. With, with ECS, you start getting a little bit back on, on those things where, you know, there is a file system. Uh, it is interesting um, because on the AWS world, there is two kinds of ECS. Uh, one of them is called ECS on EC2 and the other one is called ECS on Fargate. Fargate. Yep. Right. And um, and I think, uh, you know, I think we might need to do a roundabout trip up to go back to, <laughs> to uh, ECS and EC2 uh, after going over to VM. Yep. But, but but the one thing is like, um, like, especially because, uh, you know, as, as a decision point, ECS and Fargate, um, you will not have access to your container, your running container through the command line. Like that is something that, that um, like a it. Docker, a Docker execute where I get to right, log right, bash right. shell or something like that. Right. Yeah. Right. Like, and, 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 and they do it for security. So, so, so for security, because like uh, what happens is by default, ECS and Fargate, uh, you are running, you're running Docker. You don't know who your neighbor is. Like uh, you can be running on a big machine that is running a hundred Docker containers. One of them is yours. 99 others are from other people. So, so what happens is that AWS said like, look, um, you know, we can give you the standard output of your Docker container. We can give you all this stuff. We can give you metrics, but you don't have the ability to quote unquote log in into your, your, um, your con running container, which is something that if you've been using Docker for a long time, <laughs> sometimes you tend to do that just to see like, oh, did I mess up some of my recipe or did I do something wrong? Or I want to see 
in, in inside troubleshooting, like getting a heat dump or something and then trying to get it out. That's right. one of the fun things about app services in Azure is they actually do provide an SSH like web console. Um, if you ever go in and play around with them so that you can actually get a command prompt inside of your Docker container. Um, nice. You know, one of the differences, you know, conceptually, it's the same thing. You know, you're, you're not seeing the VMs, you know, you're, you don't get SSH access to the host machine, where if you're trying to figure out, you know, hey, is something broken on the host machine, yeah. you're not going to be able to do that. But as far as the Docker container and app services, there is like a command line console. There's still access to logs and, and other things to debug. Um, but I mean, you know, as a Java developer that's used to running jar files, you know, functions provide a really cool, fast way to get started. But as far as, hey, I'm used to running apps, ECS is a good negotiation, a good middle ground between, all right, I don't really want to own the hardware, but I also want to run like an actual, you know, long running application. So it, it, it has its space. Um, in between the completely managed functions and then the yeah. little bit more of the ownership, which is, I feel like, what we're leading into next. Yes. And let's say that that you are very picky about <laughs> like exactly how you want your environment to be, right? And and they are cases where, where that is. Um, I, I found it that if you are very CPU bound um, or, or you have like big memory requirements, um, you might bust out of like um, something that that AWS like ECS manages or that that Azure manages. Like you know they they're like oh up to sixteen gigs super easy. Maybe there's something they can do. But once you start getting beyond certain size, both on CPU and on memory, they'll say like no, you need is your own virtual machine that you can say like I want this much and and you know you can configure it. The other things that you can do is. You can configure it the way you want it, right? You start getting into uh, okay, I I I don't need this Docker image, but I want this this particular Red Hat version of Linux, mm -hmm. or I want this particular you know CentOS version of of Linux, or or all these or our Windows machines too, because uh, we we have to use those too. Like like you get you get now into I want I want to create a machine. Uh, a server or you know a server machine with this particular operating system with this particular metrics with this particular you know like uh, memory and cpu requirements yep. and that's where it comes to like you know in in um in aws it's called ec2 i think it's the uh, elastic computing version 2 um i don't know what azure calls it yeah azure i think it's just it's just basically called vms um <laughs> so i mean it's it's conceptually the same thing um, but yeah, so, but you're not waiting like three months for that, that custom Server. machine to get on, you know, a box and then, or, you know, get on and, and, and come out. Um, so, I mean, the beauty of it is, and, and it even goes beyond just like CPU and OS, like I want a GPU. They've now gotten to the point where, you know, if I want custom hardware, I can get, it. if I want SSDs instead of spinny disks or, you know, elastic storage um, <laughs> that's going to get mounted in an S3 bucket or not an S3 bucket, but like the, the, their, their virtual file store VFS, mm -hmm. um, you know, I can, I can do that type of customization. Oh, yeah. Like the, network um, too. Yeah. the networking, I can say, I want this many NIC cards, you know, so I, I can, I can do a lot of things that is almost a, a custom order, but when I'm done with it, I can just say, turn it off and I'm not charged. So, I mean, the, the, the VM pricing model is very similar um, to the ECS pricing model, um, except with a lot more flexibility. So, you know, what they look at, what both of the services look at is, okay, if you want high CPU and high memory and you have a high spec machine, your rate, your basically hourly rate or per second rate, you know, however, whatever the multiples that they, they do it in is higher the more souped up you are. But if you have a really basic machine, you can get away with, you know, fractions of a cent, um, yeah. you know, per, per minute. Um, so you're, uh, or per hour, I think is usually what, yeah, what yeah, most of them have it in. But, <laughs> you know, depending on what your specs are, you have on-demand compute power um, from either the Azure VM service or the EC2 service from AWS. And again, you get the, this is where I finally get an SSH access in both of them. 
to the host machine. Now, well, not the host machine because these 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 VMs can be running in virtualization. I'm not getting right. bare metal yeah, hardware. No, Although I believe AWS has a bare metal option, so that you you can actually get bare metal on AWS um, in certain and, instances. And it, it's worth expanding a little bit on this. Um, starting circa 2008 or 2010. Um, everything is virtualized. <laughs> so what that means is like, um, and I still remember the, the big deal with the hypervisors. And I remember, uh, what was it? VMware uh, was super, super deep into it. Um, what happened was that um, chip makers started figuring out how can they run, quote unquote, different environments without having to pay a, like usually you can always do it, but it, it usually had like a CPU penalty every time you did that. But it's starting, you know, whenever like Intel introduced hypervisor and AMD, AMD follows suit quickly. What happened is that the chip makers created sort of like these instruction sets that makes it super, super easy or super, super cheap to run multiple virtual machines on the same uh, CPU. And, and what then is like essentially took all the world by storm. And that's why like the cloud providers, you know, we said like, you don't know if you're ever running on a physical machine anymore because um you know if you were if you were, if i when i make made a bet on that i'll say like i'm probably just virtualized somewhere right because like that gives incredible flexibility for data centers to say look i'm just gonna upgrade all these things i'm gonna give them twice the memory and and as soon as i put them in then then i have double capacity to have more ec2 machines just because you know now there's more space for them to be in there Right. So so it is it is something to like consider like and, and this comes into play not, not necessarily a lot, but if you are doing something that that you really say like, gosh, I need CPU affinity, right? I need like this type of hardware affinity because I'm gonna do tricks. I'm gonna do on, things in the kernel. Yeah. yeah. Like what well, like you know, just be in mind, like, you know, and again, for 99.9% .9 of software out there is a non-issue. Uh, but for that that 0.01% where like, no, no, I I I'm gonna life burn this core by having a, a you know a, a white lock on that on that on that thread that I need it to be the fastest thing. And I think I'm talking about like trade trading is the one first one that comes into my mind. Yeah, I mean, because there's so many things to tune, right? So, I mean, you know, where a lot of these services, when you look at um, ECS and functions, which we talked about before, you know, one of them you're paying per invocation, the other one you're paying on time, but those installations, you can't tune the connection counts coming into them. I don't have control of the host machine. Once I get to the VM, yeah. I can tune the kernel to optimize connections. I can tune to optimize how I want to utilize the memory on the host, um, permissions, ports, all of that's on the table. I have SSH access. I have a, a fully provisioned virtual machine that I can do what I need to do on. And if I want to put Docker on it and, and do my own you know, ECS on that, I can do that. Um, you know, so it's, it's really opens the door to those custom solutions and, and really things that may not be economical in those other areas because the default settings maybe don't fit what I'm trying to do. Right. No. And, and, and that was the other part. Once you start getting into like provisioning your own VMs, you, you start getting into, you open essentially the door to like, for example, like chef, you, you start getting some kind of like infrastructure management. Yeah. Where you know, for those who don't know, like Chef and Sync, I guess is the open source version of it. It's a way for managing machines, right? Like um, at the very beginning, um, the way it worked, it was like somebody will get a a, a, a black box deliver it into a data center somewhere, and a person had to sit in and click next, next, next while they install Windows two thousand. And then after that, they have like this lit, big long laundry list of, oh, now it needs this drivers, now it needs this services, and now it needs SQL Server. Um, a lot of that got automated out, um, you know, with the big DevOps movement, uh, where essentially it's a little bit of like, um, I guess uh, provisioning as code. Well, it's not quite provisioning as it is a provisioning as code. Yeah, that's probably what I would call it too. Yeah, like where, where you where you said like, look, 
on this new machine, I want you to, you know, install SQL Server. I want you to install these things. I want you to open the firewall this way. And, and essentially you create, you know, chef recipe, what's called chef recipes um, that gets you all that. So if you are really thinking that you want to go the VM route, like, you know, say like, look, I want to have some authority on, you know, on these things and, and it's really important to you, then, then, uh, then do consider that you probably want then then the some infra, some some kind of like provision managed um, software to help you manage that infrastructure because yeah. you know like like we said you know like we're going from the most restrictive but the one that you don't think about anything to now you're getting you are working on a machine and one virtual machine you can set up manually two virtual machines you can set set up manually. You need to suddenly provision a hundred ones because there's a big, you know, thundery hair problem. You cannot do that manually. You probably yeah. want to have some, and that's, you know, you have the freedom. So now you have the responsibility of figuring out how to. And it's it. not just about scale. It's also about security. So you're owning security yeah. patching now. So when that AWS and Azure are not going to upgrade that OS for you, once a vulnerability comes out, that's on you once it's a VM. Yep. Um, so, you know, they're not going to secure the ports for you. I mean, there's different policies I can attach in order to block things um, at a network level using some of the supporting services, what we'll be getting into next. Um, but I've got to set that up. They're not managing it for me as they are on functions and, and ECS. Right, right. And, and, uh, and, and the, last, the last part on this, what I was going to say is like, um, so just going back to the ECS example, which is like what is called EC2 on ECS. Uh, and this is, this is a eternal confusion terms. So, so I want to spend the extra time. I may even throw in like a little like, like diagram in it. Um, <laughs> but the idea is that, you know, now that you know that ECS is about running Docker containers, um, you know, we said like, um, AWS have two choices. The first one to run these containers of ECS is in Fargate, which is completely managed by AWS. This is why you don't have access to, to running things on the shell uh, and stuff like that. But on the other hand, like you don't manage any of that infrastructure, right? But the other choice that you have is like, let's say, look, I still want to have control on how like my Docker ecosystem works, right? And, uh, and I want to say like, look, I want to, you know, provision this kind of machines to run Docker containers, right? So then what you can do is what is called um, ECS, ECS on EC2, which is you create your cluster of machines, you set it up the way you want it on EC2, you know, you create your virtual machines, you say, this is what I want. And then these are essentially then the machines that are gonna be essentially the platform where your Docker containers that you're provisioning through ECS will run. So every time you create a new, I think AWS is called tasks. When you create a new task, you sort of say like, what do you want to run this task on uh, the EC ECS Fargate or you want to run it on the ECS one? And you create your clusters You say, no, I don't want it on Fargate. I want it on my EC2 cluster that you know I set up just the way I want it for Docker containers, right? So, so it's almost like a little bit of, of, of mix where you do have usually to provision big virtual VMs for it, but then once you provision those, you can run all the containers you want or you know that, that that you want to do it, right? So it gives you also it gives you the ability to then troubleshoot what's going on in the containers. Like like Amazon will let you essentially run you know Docker sec on things that are running within your own cloud, right? Like we, 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 with your own. EC2 server or virtual machine servers. Um, yep. Yeah, and, then, and, if, and then the, if you want to scale up even more and use Kubernetes, you know, both Azure and AWS provide managed Kubernetes services where it's it's kind of the other way around where it's it's managing the Kubernetes side um, for you. So it's 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 a little bit of the combination of well, I have VMs, but I'm not directly managing them. They're they're kind of saying I'm I'm kind of giving either AWS or Azure a spec of what kind of servers I want to put in the pool, and then they're building that out in scale so that I just have to worry about okay, I just want to deploy my Helm charts or my YAML files in order to get Kubernetes to do what I want it to do. Yeah, no, and that is 
like uh, I think that is the other, like Kubernetes is we probably have another episode. Yeah, that's we're not going to get into Kubernetes today, but it's it's worth mentioning that you know yeah. it's it's not just the micro to macro scale. It's that's on the the, the far end of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. That's like I'm thinking like, oh my gosh, there is so much, right? Like, yeah, from Helm and how it does all the stuff. But but you know, it, it, we'll put it as an as an IOU. Like you know, we'll we'll come future back show. And- but we should talk about the supporting services before we we close up because oh yeah. You know, the execution environment is just one piece of it. That's what's running my code. But there's a lot of things that go into supporting those things. So, you know, one example is I have an ECS cluster or I have a VM cluster and they're all running the same instances. How do I route traffic equally between those instances? Don't I need networking infrastructure to make that work? Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's that's where we go to to the load balancing aspect. and. And this is this is it took me a while to understand like a, a little bit of the DevOps. Like we were, I think, all the way from the 19th to like 2008, it was you know like there were developers and there were operations, and developers just like showed some code over the wall and operations figure out how to run it. Uh, you know, I think after that you start getting appreciation of like oh my gosh, there's a lot of stuff to do, right? And and. The thing is, like, we always think about clusters and hundreds of machines running. Auto but, scaling. Yeah, it, it's like a magic, right? Like, but but if you think about the operational construct of how does that happen, right? Like, for example, uh, one of the things that, that that usually happens, like, you know, is that you have this router in front of it that decides to balance the load. And say like you know there's a request and I have a hundred servers. Okay, your this request is going to go to server one, and this request is going to go to server two, and this request is going to go to server three, right? And so you need to have sort of like this kind of router in front of it that it may like and, and depending on how you set it up, it may need to keep like that 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 connection. So meaning like you know if it's a long session, uh, you know. Um, you know, there's like, oh, I remember you. You were connected to server one, so let's affinity. Just, yeah, right. Like there is <laughs> there's a server affinity for requests, like and all these other things, right? So so if if we were on the two thousand days, then somebody needs to create that, and somebody needs to say, tell me what are the servers that are registered to this to this particular router, right? Uh, you know, oh, I created a new server over there. Then usually the operations guy will say, well, give me the IP address of that server, give me the the, um, the address, and then then um, then then I can put it up in rotation, right? So so a lot of the complications that sometimes uh, if if you're never being exposed to the cloud and you're exposed to it, it's like, why do I have to set up these things? A lot of it is is because you know, like now you're getting exposed to the upside, which it's. You know, once you understand how it works, it's amazing. But because we never had thought about it, we think it, it, we always feel it like it's so weird. Like, the, and the first concept, like on 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 AWS, is called target groups, right? Every time you create you create a a, a new instance or you create quote unquote a cluster or stuff like that or ECS, usually there is a target group that identifies those tasks. And and what the target group is doing is like saying, look, this family of servers is for my shopping cart. You know, this family of servers over here, this Docker containers here is for my, you know, like batch processing backlog. So, so you sort of start splitting up your, 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 if you think about your infrastructure, there is servers for, you know, things that I need them to scale this way. There are servers that I need to scale for this, this other microservice, especially microservice architecture where you can have different little services running on different little VMs doing many little different things, right? So, but the thing is like, once you have that target group, you know, the target group is then now responsible of saying like, okay, um, are these servers healthy? You know, and that is something like usually you start seeing, this is an ops thing where I want to know if that particular server is working the right way or not, right? And there's the the need to have like health endpoints where it tells, you know, like, oh, the, ser- the server goes, uh, usually the easiest way that most people will do it is like, can I pull up a web page, right? Like you give it a URL, it goes to that server, pulls up that web page. It returns 200. That means the server is in good health. Returns 500. It means that that server is bad. And then the fun part is that once you start having those kinds of things built in, then then the target group with the load balancer can start doing things like, look, 
that instance reported that is bad. Let's just kill it and create another one over here, you know, and register it with the target group. So if the load balancer knows like where it needs to route traffic and all of these things happen behind, like you never seen it. Like, like that is the fun part about it. Like, uh, like if you, for example, the other thing that, that you could say is for example, um, you know, look, I want to auto scale when my CPU is, the average CPU of my target group, it hits like 60% or 70%, right? Or, or when the memory that my target group is using is at 70%, right? There's many dimensions where you can say, do you want to scale? But then the target, the, like that, the load balancer with the target group is, is in charge of monitoring and saying like, oh, we're getting close to 70%. Let's spin up more instances. And you tell it, how do you want it to scale up? You tell it, how do you want to scale down? But, but all these things are essentially part of the target group slash elastic load balancers that like, you know, uh, like for example, AWS provides. And I'm sure that, that, um, that Azure has exactly the same. Yeah, I mean, you can basically replace target group with backend pool and conceptually everything you're talking about is the same. So it's I mean, you know, they just have a different terminology, but as far as load balancing, you know, application load balancers do have all the health checks and, and you know, draining rules and, and, and all sorts of things that, again, as an application developer, you probably never thought of, but somebody was handling for you uh, when you were in your on-prem <laughs> right, right. configuration, oh, right? Days of um, like <laughs> now you get to do that yourself or you just have to understand, you know, what are the different kind of toggles to go. And, and you know, most modern app frameworks are coming with health check endpoints. So it's like, a lot of this you don't have to build. It's just a matter of picking, enabling. Uh, you know, a, a modern framework and enabling the the correct things. And then you know, a lot of this load balancer interactivity it just kind of works. Right, right, and and that is the big thing. Like for example, to to tie it back, like if you're using like Spring, um, if you do Spring Cloud, the actuator will have Spring. It will, it will expose an endpoint how like slash actuator slash health, right. And it will, you know, and it's, you know, by default, it will almost like auto configure depending on the things that you have. If you say you have a database, uh, you use Spring Data and you use the database, it'll try to figure out if the database connection is healthy. If you're using like, you know, some kind of like metrics management, it'll try to figure out that it's running fine. If you're using something like Redis, it'll try to figure out as my Redis or, or my, you know, working the way it's supposed to. Um, but you know, the idea is that you do take those endpoints and you start updating them with things that are maybe more closer to your application. If there's things that you are watching, like you create socket connections to something and need to monitor that those socket connections are still fine, right? And that's part of your health check, right? It's always, you know, it's it, it, it's always being asked for. And if you never knew why, why do I need to create this programmatic health check instead of going to a console and looking at things. The reason is because of that. Because all these, once you have a health check, there's there's you know load balancers that then can make sure that oh that thing is unhealthy, it's unresponsive because yep. it run out of memory, right? Like uh, it it can just kill it out and create a new one, and you don't have to be on that three in the morning call uh, saying <laughs> like hey a server died and <laughs> why did it die? Yep, and I think the other the other. Thing is is leading in once you have a load balancer there's also conceptually you want to create a domain name that allows people from the outside to find it or even if you're doing internal networking just being able to have a more sane way of routing your services most of these services when you create a vm when you create a load balancer it's going to give it a domain name but it's going to be very specific to the cloud you're using and it's going to mean something in that cloud if i want to get back to connecting to the outside world again AWS and Azure both have DNS services that can help facilitate that. So Route 53 on the AWS side, where I can basically just create DNS entries either for internal DNS or external DNS. And um, within Azure, you also have a DNS service um, in order to do a very similar thing. Right, and, and if you think about it, right, like that is a progression, right? You first created your you create your code, you create your jar, you figure out how to deploy it. Let's say that we decided Docker on ECS, then, then you, you sort of like define the target group by task, and then you have the load balancer. The load balancer will give you this long name, you know, AWS specific, 
Uh, and then suddenly the last thing you need to do is uh, you go to Route 53, which manages your domain names and uh, you add, you know, say like, oh, I want this domain name to point to this target, to, to this load balancer. So then, then, you know, then when the name resolves, the very first thing it's gonna go is it's gonna write 53. Oh, my aid record, which is essentially the record for most of our, most of the stuff that, that we usually do to try to get to, it says like, oh, it needs to go to that particular load balancer. It gets to that load balancer, it's like, oh, I have 50 Docker tasks running. I'm gonna pick this one and then it's gonna shoot it all the way over there. So, you know, you get that access all the way from the outside to the inside. And the good thing is that you can protect each step of the way, I meaning like, like, like uh, AWS and, and Azure are very good at saying, look, it's not like your server is sitting out there unless you specifically said that. Uh, most of the time, it's just gonna be like uh, what is called NATIT. So, so you know, like, like you will never know. Like, you know, you get essentially. I think uh, AWS have like a family of a very small family of IPs that are public, and then, um, but they they will never know that you are hitting that particular, you know. Cloud uh, container running on on your private cloud or or on your on your particular uh, cloud account, um, and it's going through all this magic. So so the the fun part is that this is actually hard work if you if you were gonna do this in an ops way, right? Like if you actually wanted to do exactly the same thing, where you have a DNS, you want to create that isolation, you wanted to like uh, you know. Um, create that scalability, create those routers that, that scale up or down and have that infrastructure. If you were gonna replicate all of that uh, locally, like saying like, I, I don't care about clouds, I just want to create my own AWS. It's very, very, very hard. Like, uh, mm -hmm. like you know, so so that is essentially why, a lot, why they had the adoption that they had because people really don't want to manage all these things. They'd rather just, just somebody else manage and just yep. pay for, for pay for, for the ability for not worrying about it, right? And, and as a DevOps people, because like now the movement is DevOps, um, sometimes it's, you know, it, it was interesting that that mental shift where at the beginning, if a DNS entry didn't work, I will just, you know, pick up the phone back when we had phones before Slack and, you know, call the like the ops guy or, you know, that it's like, hey, something's going on with the DNS entry. Can you look at it? And then that, because I did not have access, right? Like as a developer, we usually never had access to DNS servers and, and uh, an ops person will say like, you know, you're, you know, number 350 on the list, you know, <laughs> you wait until next week to get that DNS fix. Uh, now, because of, you know, if you're working on a cloud, chances are, you know, that, that you may have more range of looking at what things are happening that than that you think. And a lot yeah. of it is because of this DevOps. And the good yeah. part about it though is like, you know, even though we've been going through a lot of things and I know it sounds complicated, each one of them individually do make sense. This allows you to troubleshoot. Like like for example, the biggest thing that sometimes happens is like I go to www.mything.com and it never comes up. And you're like what could be wrong, right? Now you sort of know that you, you start by, by you know, you can, you can start on the out layer saying like, oh, do I have a Route 53 entry? And usually when you have a developer AWS console, most people will at least allow you read access to see what's, what's what, right? And then when you go to Route 53, you find the record, oh, looks right. It's pointing to this particular load balancer. Then you can go to the, to the load balancer. It's usually on the EC2 for AWS. And there's a load balancer section. You find the load balancer and figure out is this the right target group. You go to the target group, you know, and then is the definition of the target group right? Do, is the health check pointed to the right place? Maybe it's pointing to the wrong to the to the wrong port or pointing to the things that are not quite correctly. And then you can keep going down. And it's like, oh, okay, it's going to the right place. And you go to like, oh, it's going to my ECS instance and the task. And then you look at the task, and the task never started, or it's always in an infinite loop. You can you can now troubleshoot these things because, like we said, it's it's it, it's even though it's a lot, if you just look at it leg, like like pieces of Lego, it's visibility, right? So the, yeah. the self the amount of self service also gives deep visibility into the entire infrastructure to the point that developers have never had that because you know the ops team doesn't build those those type of dashboards because it 
costs a lot of development time to, to build that out. AWS, Azure, these cloud services, they've already built these things. So it's just a matter of scale. So, I mean, you get the scale of these larger companies that have built these large data centers that are built to scale without having to learn all the lessons of scale yourself. You can kind of take advantage of it. And that's one of the biggest things, you know, so if, if you, and they've added all of these, these supporting services for networking, you know, I, I'm just going to list off a few of them because I think we're running a little short on time, but you know, they all have pub, pub sub models. So between SNS and SQS and AWS and message bus um, in Azure, you don't have to set up an MQ service anymore oh, by yourself gotcha. if you don't want one. Yeah. yeah. You know, the, the other thing like for, um, you know, for storage, you have S3 where you have basically extremely large file storage that can be available and access controlled in AWS. In Azure, you have, you know, you have blob storage, you have a number of features that give you Give file storage where you know you're sitting on a VM or you're sitting in a, in a file directory where you run out of room, and now it's like okay, I got to buy a new disk. No, these are elastic systems. You got to pay for how much you put on there. But the, the scale the scale problem is is sort of you know not something you have to think about. Somebody else is taking care of that. So yeah. having the visibility, having the options and supporting services to say, hey, I'm not an expert in in MQ, but Maybe I can just spin up the service and play around with the SDK and see how it works. And, th and that's essentially what we're hoping to do with you guys next week, you know, when we kind of do a little bit more of a deep dive into creating the cloud infrastructure through maybe, the maybe we'll SDKs. Maybe toy project that, that, that. I think so. I mean, you know, I think that, you know, we, we're, we're going to show different ways of programmatically working with it. Um, but hopefully this episode has given you kind of that, Round that high level where it's like, how do I, how do I think about this? You know, what are, what are the different things that I need to be considering when I'm picking which thing to use in the cloud? Because there's usually a hundred different ways to do it. Um, and there's not one right way, but there's probably one way that's a little bit more right. Yeah. And if, and like, and, and yeah, just to reiterate that, that part is, is the, the fun part, you know, when it comes with all these, these visibility is that, Instead of waiting, you know, two weeks for somebody to look at the ticket of why DNS doesn't work, you can just go in the next five minutes and see like, oh, yeah, this looks wrong. I know exactly what it is. And sometimes, you know, if you have enough permissions, then you can just fix it yourself. Uh, <laughs> other times, you know, they'll be like, you know, um, you know, maybe you have only read-only access, but you can just tell your ops teams like, look, I see that DNS entry is wrong, or I see that, that the load balancer has the wrong target group or the wrong health check. Can you just fix this? And suddenly, instead of three weeks of figuring out what it is, it takes you less than a day to like, oh, I got it. This is easy. I can, they can just do it. And, and, and that, is, that is the huge value. Like, uh, I, you know, once you start getting into, into some of the ops part, for me, like the big thing is like, I don't have to wait for anyone. We can just go in, we can figure it out we can self-serve, uh, you know, part of the, you know, part of the benefits of having that responsibility, right? So. Yep. You control your own destiny, but you also control, control your, your own destiny. destiny. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> there's no one to blame when it goes wrong. <laughs> but okay. Yeah, that's, we're hoping to guide you through that. So hopefully you got a lot out of this episode. I know I, I, there's, there's a ton more material to cover, but I hope that gave you a good overview of, 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 like, of at least two of the clouds and, and the core concepts around them. Yeah, no, and, and for those who are being uh, avid listeners, you know, like, uh, you know, happy 100 episode, uh, right? And if you just uh, jump in, um, these are considered like, you know, if, even if you're a latecomer, you know, even the first episodes, you know, like of Pop House, they are, they are mostly evergreen. Meaning, like, they they are things that apply um, throughout. Like our first episodes were very going deep into like the the weeds of like just core Java programming, and we sort of start branching out more of like the libraries and stuff. But you know, like again, if you're a latecomer, you haven't heard a hundred episodes yet. Uh, go back and 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 you know you know, put it on your commute, like I guarantee you that the more that you listen to this, 
it's you know the, the better engineer that you you can be because you know again we cover things soup to nuts we try to make it you know demystify a lot of like the things that happen uh remember like uh i always like to say to like my junior developers there's no magic in programming a computer is dumb it will do exactly as you tell them a lot of it is just understanding what is happening behind the scenes and and uh Hopefully, you know, 200 more episodes, right? Yeah, 200, 200 more, more episodes. And yeah, you don't have to start at episode one to understand again that this has always been targeted for the, the, the beginner audience, the folks that, that haven't maybe dealt with cloud should be able to hopefully listen to this episode. And, you know, if you haven't dealt with Java and you came in because you saw cloud and you're interested in Java, definitely go back. We've got oh, a yeah, ton yeah. of stuff. And we're going to get into more Java next episode. So don't don't think like oh, we failed right. on that. <laughs> We got you. All right. That's it for this episode. Happy programming. Happy 100. (laughs) Take care. All right. Bye, everybody.